Pennsylvania 2021 Impact Stage, and I am very excited to welcome our next speaker, Gil Dibner. Gil is the founder of Angular Ventures, a $40 million first check venture fund based in London and Tel Aviv that was founded in 2018 and backs enterprise-oriented startups building global category leaders. Prior to founding Angular Ventures, Gil established and led 26 investments. Of those 26, five have become unicorns. He is an active early stage investor in European and Israeli technology companies and has also invested in the Romanian startup Planable. Gil holds an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and an AB in economics from Harvard University. For a presentation on a VC view on enterprise sales, please welcome Gil Dibner to the impact stage at Texylvania. Gil, the floor is yours. Hi, am I on? I guess I am. Okay. And then share screen. Let's see if this works. All right. Uh, I can't see Hoppin, so if someone could confirm to me that this is working, that'd be great. Oh, it's 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 all working. It's all good. We're good okay, to go. Super. I'll be here the whole time, too. Cool, Trevor. Thanks. So th thanks so much for, for uh, the very kind intro and uh, for the chance to speak here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and you know, I wish it was in person, um, but uh, we're still kind of, I guess, dealing with COVID, so uh, I'll do the best I can remotely. Um, what I want to talk about um, is a VC view on enterprise sales, um, and let's see if I can advance the slides. There we go. Okay, so uh, first, just a bit about Angular and myself. Um, I've been backing uh, enterprise tech companies for about 15 years now across Europe and Israel. These are the logos of some of the companies that I've backed. Um, in, in various forms, working at VCs as an angel and, and, and now most recently with Angular. Um, this is just a quick summary of what Angular does. Uh, we invest very early, uh, typically first check. Um, sometimes that first check is a friends and family round. Sometimes that first check is a series A. Um, and we invest at, really as early as possible. Um, check size is anywhere from about 250K to more like two or $3 million. Now the size is a bit outdated. Um, We've invested across Europe and Israel, um, and we're very proud of the co-investors that we've had join us. Um, you know, some of some of the best VCs in the world have have uh, gone on to lead 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 rounds in our companies. Um, my personal journey um, in in sales, as it were, um, really had to do with raising the fund. So, um, as I was raising Angular One for the first time, you know that that took that was a three and a half year process to raise that fund with lots of meetings and lots of flights and lots of conversations. Um, so it took almost four years. Um, I met with 1,400 prospects, um, actively engaged with about 600 of them, um, and then took uh, about 300 first meetings or calls in person, um, and uh, and ended up raising the you know relatively small fund. Um, in, in some sense, only $41 million, but the process, the sales process to get that done was, was very, very intense. And so while I'm not a salesperson myself and don't certainly don't sell software for a living, um, I feel like I've walked that, I've walked a few miles in a salesperson's shoes and I've certainly invested in many, many companies and worked with many, many founders as they have built up a sales operation and, and have the, you know, and what this presentation is, it's really a VC view on, on the sales process. Um, so one thing I want to say is that, you know, value of relationships and, and from my own fundraising. So this is basically a pie chart of the breakdown of investors in Angular One by the size of their commitment. And, you know, what you can sort of see from the graph is that there's a huge variety in size. Um, and, you know, the largest LP we have is 40 times the size of the smallest one. Um, one LP committed after a 20 minute meeting. Another LP took three years of work. Um, and I think that's a mirror for enterprise sales, right? You have these vastly different sizes of contracts. You've got big customers and small customers and customers with a quick process and customers with a slow process and customers that, you know, want exactly what you're selling and customers that don't realize they want what you're selling and customers that don't want what you're selling. Um, and so th that's the, you know, the value of these relationships can vary dramatically and the value of your time can value can vary dramatically depending on who you're talking to. Um, one one quick word on sort of enterprise uh, versus deep tech. When we talk about what we do and we talk about sales, um, we describe our world as, as spanning the enterprise universe and the deep tech universe. Um, so enterprise really kind of means anyone who is selling software to an enterprise buyer. 
Um, and deep tech obviously means, uh, you know, deeper technology, whether that's, you know, space technology or, uh, you know, advanced, you know, nano materials and stuff, stuff like that. Um, there's obviously some overlap because sometimes you're selling deep technology to an enterprise buyer. Um, but this is kind of the universe that Angular invests in. And I think it's the universe in which this presentation is relevant. Okay, so what this presentation basically consists of is 16 lessons um, that I've picked up over the years of working with startups, investing in startups, and doing some sales myself um, on, on how to think about sales. Um, the first one is you are either post-product market fit or pre-product market fit, and that's a very big difference, right? Um, the critical thing here is to, is to be very honest with yourself about when you have achieved product market fit and when you haven't, because the way you sell is going to change dramatically when you cross that threshold, right? Um, Pre-product market fit, the sales process is unnatural because you don't have a fit. It doesn't fit. It's like trying to fit a, a foot into a shoe that doesn't fit, right? Post that product market fit, it will become much more natural, repeatable, and scalable, and you'll start to be focused on those questions, right? So the first set of questions you're doing is, how can I make this more natural? How can I communicate better? How can I modify my product maybe to, to fit what the market wants? How can I communicate the right way? Once you have that fit worked out, then you're starting to think about, okay, how can I make this more repeatable and more scalable and, and do it at a higher volume? Um, one um, framework that I, I, I think is helpful in thinking about this is that over time, as you move towards product market fit and then beyond market fit, you have these two lines that are kind of crossing, right? There's the market resistance. Over time, if you're selling advanced technology and markets are maturing, they're getting more and more comfortable with, with what you're selling right? Um, they, they are, their, their resistance is going down. At the same time, your product is getting better all the time, right? And it can be therefore very hard to predict when those two lines are going to cross. But at some point, the resistance is going down to the point where your product is ready enough to, to be able to generate that sensation of product market fit. And then the whole game starts to change. Um, lesson number two is that founders should really try to embrace the chaos um, of early stage enterprise sales. Um, the, the graphic I'm showing here is, is this is sort of the theoretical model of what a marketing and sales funnel looks like, right? Um, this is what they would teach you in business school. This is kind of what, what people think of. Um, we do marketing activities. It generates leads. It generates MQLs and SALs and SQLs and all these things. Um, and then those turn into opportunities and then those turn into customers. Then we do customer support. And it seems very structured and obvious, right? Reality of early stage enterprise sales looks more like this. You're clinging to a rock face for dear life and hoping something converts before you run out of money. And I think it's very important to embrace that chaos. It's, it's climbing a rock face. It's not running an MBA model or, or running Excels, right? Um, it's important to have a sense of what that ideal structure looks like, but your day-to-day -day is going to look very different and, and you should get comfortable with that reality. Um, another thing that I've, I've learned and has been you know, very effective, I think, for a lot of companies is to think about that, you know, theoretical business schooly kind of sales funnel, but to approach it backwards. And what I mean by this is that, you know, we think about the funnel as having a direction, right? You, you, you put leads into the, you, you do marketing and you put leads into the top of the funnel and then they move their way through the funnel and then we can eventually take money from them. Um, I actually think it works better for early stage startups to think about perfecting that funnel from the from the, from the bottom up as opposed to from the top down. What I mean by that is you, you will have some early customers that hopefully you have somehow found, right? It could be your best friend. It could be an old contact. It could be you just got lucky, right? Um, make sure that company is super happy first. In other words, do the customer support and customer success first, right? Then start to think about, okay, from the leads that I have or the, the opportunities I have, how can I close them and so on? And only at the very end, once you've perfected all these things, start investing time and energy in figuring out how to do marketing. And the reason for that is that you want to make sure that the, the next step in the funnel is ready when you're perfecting a certain step. If you, if you make the mistake of investing time and money in tons of marketing, but then you have no idea what to do with the leads, right? You end up wasting a lot of good opportunities and, and potentially burning yourself with a lot of potential customers who are excited about the marketing message that you've received but then you don't know how to qualify a lead, right? Or you don't know how to sell it, or you don't know how to define an opportunity, or you don't know how to implement it. Or once you implement it, you don't know how to keep the customer happy, right? So it's very important, I think, to think about this funnel in both directions. And early on, I would think about it backwards as opposed to forwards. Um, lesson four, kind of an obvious one, but make sure that you're investing in process and tools. 
even super, super early. I mean, we work with customer, sorry, we work with companies who are usually investing before they have any sales at all. Sometimes they have no contact with customers at all. They're, they're very, very early. And, you know, at some point in the process, you know, once we invest, you know, a few months go by and then suddenly like, yeah, we're talking to a few customers. And it's never too early to start putting that into some kind of a CRM tool. Um, so this is a screenshot from Pipedrive. It's one tool among many. I, I have found it to be very e easy to work with, but there's many CRM tools out there. The point is not which tool is the best, and the point is not even what process is the best. The point is make sure you're investing in process long before you think you need it. Um, it will help you track and learn from what you're doing, and it will also help you communicate to the outside world what you're achieving. That, that's a super important thing, and the, the, you know, the best CRM tools are designed to help a single person achieve a lot more with their time. And as a startup founder, you know, you could use any efficiency gains you can get. Um, lesson number five is that the cavalry will not save you. Um, don't fall for the seductive idea that some experienced or American or San Francisco sales professional will somehow accelerate your early stage startup growth plan. Um, this has been just consistently true over time. Um, and I've seen this pattern repeat itself many, many times. These Professional salespeople lack startup DNA. There are often intercultural challenges when a company from you know, country A is hiring a salesperson from country B remotely. It can be very difficult to make that culture work, both because of you know, national cultures, but also because the culture of sales and the culture of startups are very, very different, right? Salespeople want structure. They want to be able to predict how much money they're going to make every quarter, every year. They want to understand what their bonus is going to be. Startups are finding their way. They're looking for product market fit. They're, they're opportunistic, they're looking for bigger opportunities all the time, and they're innovating, and those are very different cultures. Um, professional salespeople are expensive. They're, they, they're, they got into sales in most cases because it was a, it's a great way for them to make a lot of money, um, and they're accustomed to a level of support that as a startup you usually can't provide, right? So the salesperson said, yeah, you know, I sold $10 million of software last year at this big company, now I want to work for you and I can do the same for you. They might genuinely want to work for you and they might genuinely think they can work for you and can succeed, but they, they don't realize how little support you can provide them as a startup, right? You don't have a graphics department. You might not have a customer success team. You might not have a marketing department. There's all kinds of things that they're used to having in terms of supporting tools that you might not be able to, uh, you know, you, 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 you might not be able to offer them. Um, salespeople are motivated primarily by cash and not equity. And that's a different cultural setup and a you know, mental setup. And that can be very difficult if you're in an environment where everyone else in your team is motivated by the equity at that early, early stage. Bringing on a person who's motivated by cash can be very demotivating and very frustrating for them because they're not, your, your, your business is not set up to support them. Um, and the other question is obviously, why are they talking to you? Right? Salespeople um, are very good at sales. And one thing they're very good at is selling themselves. And if a salesperson is used to making or talks about, you know, hitting quota on a multi-million dollar you know, quota and therefore taking several hundred thousand dollars home, why would they be talking to a startup that may not have any evidence that they can generate that kind of volume of sales, right? Um, so first of all, there's this cultural mismatch, but there's a cultural mismatch. But there can also be a genuine desire on the salesperson. They want to be entrepreneurial. They want to work for a startup. But it's a huge transition for them to make that transition. And it doesn't always work. Um, in fact, it usually doesn't work. Um, lesson six in sales is that your pricing is almost certainly wrong as an early stage startup. Um, pricing is a whole huge topic. And we could talk about it for hours. And, and one thing I've learned is that every company is almost totally different. And the best uh, products, there's a, a ton of thinking goes into how they're pricing and why they're pricing and which features are on which side of paywalls and so on and so forth um, and how features are bundled, et cetera. Um, think really, really hard about pricing and understand that you're going to need to do a lot of experiments. Ask your customers about pricing. Be honest with them. Let them be honest with you. Think about total cost of ownership for your, custo for, for, your, for your customers and think about their actual ROI. Not just how much are they paying you, but how much does it cost them to use your software or use your service, right? If, it, if they need to put a person on staff, then their TCO is higher than just what they're paying you, right? Um, and probably you'll have to raise your prices. That's, that's kind of essential. And, and most startups we work with end up underpricing their software and uh, it, it, it's almost, the easiest piece of advice a VC can ever give an entrepreneur is raise your prices. And in my experience, it's almost always true. Um, 
lesson seven is that sometimes a million dollars is as easy as 50K and sometimes a million dollars is as hard as 50K. And the point here is that you, know, you shouldn't be afraid to go after very big deals um, as long as they are not too big or too slow or too complex or too unique, right? In other words, the amount of effort it can take you as an early startup to squeeze 50K out of a customer um, is so great sometimes that you might as well go for bigger customers, right? Um, and, and as I said earlier, don't be afraid to raise your prices as long as you're charging for the right thing. In other words, if you've already gone through all of the pain of explaining your solution, penetrating the account and going through procurement and proving the, the product and all of that stuff, you might as well ask for what the product is actually worth. Um, and this last point here is actually quite important, I think. Um, early validation is wonderful. You know, large customer using your product is fantastic, but there's very rarely any points for penetration pricing. What I mean by that is if you have a flagship customer that's using your software, um, there's no reason to sort of give them a discount just so that you can close them. On some level, you're better off giving it to them for free than charging a very, very low price and then having to explain why the price point was so low. A very low price point can make a customer feel like, oh, well, this must not be that valuable or must not be that ready or they must not have any other customers, right? And a very low price point from a VC perspective can say, well, wait a second, these guys either don't know what the product is worth or don't know how to sell it um, or the market's not very good because it's not worth that much, right? So it's much better and much cleaner to say, you know what, I gave it to them for free and I'll try to charge them a real price next year or they've agreed to, to use it for free for, you know, for three years and they promised to give me feedback in a, in a monthly feedback session um, and let me use their logo to, to you know, communicate with the market that they're using me and in, you know, in exchange for that, they're not paying. That's better in some cases than charging a, a stupidly low price. Um, lesson eight is that your average revenue per account, your ARPA, is your destiny. Um, these are two charts from two great guys, Christoph Jans, who's a, a partner with a fund called Point Nine, which is a great fund in Berlin, and then Nathan Latka, who runs a fantastic, um, uh, I guess it's like a podcast series. It's a sort of a series of YouTube videos, primarily on sales and SaaS metrics. Um, these are two versions of exactly the same graph. Um, and what Nathan is doing in his graph is he's basically taking a bunch of, a bunch of companies that he knows and he's plotting their um, annual contract value, um, sorry, their average contract value on, on, the, on the Y axis against how many customers they have on the Y axis. And if you multiply the number of customers by the average contract value, you get the ARR, right? And so what he's showing you with the two lines is how, you know, what, what combinations drive you to becoming a $10 million a year company, sorry, sorry, a $1 million company or a $100 million a year in revenue company, right? And what you can see is that if you look at the, the red circle, the companies that are doing more than $100 million a year tend to be clustered in the $10,000 to $100,000 average contract value zone, right? And there's some reasons for that, which we can talk about in a second. Um, what Christoph has done is basically take the same idea and make it look really simple. And, and I think it's a very helpful graph. What he's done, he said, look, to get to a $100 million SaaS business, there's basically five formulas, right? You can sell $100 um, a year software a million times. You can sell a million dollar a year software once, right? Or you can sell $10,000 a year software 10,000 times or whatever, you, you know, you can see the idea. The elephant and the, and the gazelle or the deer, whatever that is, those that that red circle corresponds to the red circle in in the other graph right basically this idea that the easiest way to grow as an enterprise software company is to figure out a way to charge people between let's say ten thousand or a hundred thousand per year or something like maybe fifty thousand to you know three hundred thousand so it's, it's a logarithmic graph so it's kind of hard hard to compare exactly but but the point is um at that zone, you know, if, you're, if you're selling a million dollar a year, if that's your price point, there aren't that many customers that can pay that. And those contracts are usually very complicated and hard to do and require a ton of heavy lifting enterprise sales. On the other hand, if you're charging $100 a year, um, you need millions of customers before you can get to scale or hundreds of thousands of customers before you can get to scale. But there's something kind of magical about that $100,000 price point, give or take. Right, which is that, hey, with not that many customers, you know, with somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 customers, I can get to a $100 million a year business. Um, and, and each one of these points, like whether you're a mouse or a whale or an elephant or a rabbit, 
that determines so much of the way your business operates, right? Your price point determines how you sell, what your sales cycle is, what kind of salespeople you have, what your, what your different marketing channels are, whether you're inbound or outbound, what the mix is between those things. All of these different aspects of building your company and driving your sales, so much of that is determined by your uh, average revenue per account, right? Even you know, how the procurement process works. Is the price point high enough that it needs to be approved by the CFO? Or is it low enough that a customer can put it on their credit card? Can a customer start by putting it on their credit card and then call up their CFO and you scale, right? All of these things are determined by the price point. And so it determines so much about the way your company operates. Um, lesson nine, um, the reason that this is true is because unit economics are everything. And unit economics is, you know, a phrase I'm sure you're aware of, which is like, let's think about, in addition to thinking about your company as a whole, let's think about like customer by customer, product by product, salesperson by salesperson, what the economics look like for them, right? And one of the frameworks that I use is say, look, let's think about this in a, in a two by two grid. Let's start by thinking about what are the unit economics by customer for you, right? And what that means is, you know, how do accounts behave over time? What are your gross margins over time? Can you measure the profitability and quality of accounts? And can you predict account behavior? Meaning is an account profitable or unprofitable, right? What is your actual gross margin by customer? Are you charging enough for your model to work on a customer by customer basis? For them, from the customer's perspective, you also have to think about unit economics, right? We talked about this earlier. What is the ROI for them? What's the TCO for them? Is your pricing right from their perspective? Do they think you're charging too much? Do they think you're charging too little? Do they think you're charging the right way? Is it easy for them to justify what they're paying you? Right? All of those questions, right? What's the time to value for them? Right? It could be that you know, you're super happy because you're sitting making a ton of money and they're taking a huge bet on you because it's going to take them five years to get to prove that they've gotten value from your software, right? So being aware of the unit economics from a customer's point of view is very, very important. And similarly, by sales resource, right? You should think about the unit economics of your sales resources for you, right? From your perspective, are your sales resources performing? How many salespeople, how many support people, how many success people do you need to make sure that you're able to operate? What's the fully loaded cost of sales and marketing per account that you're adding? Is, does, it, does it make sense? Are you, you know, are, are, are you actually losing money because it's so expensive to run your content operation that you're not making it up, making up for it on the gross margins, et cetera. And also from the perspective of the salespeople. And this is why, for example, ARPA is so important in driving what your business looks like, because it also has to make sense for the salesperson. If a salesperson is going to go to work for you, he or she has to make a calculation that it actually makes economic sense for me to work for your company. If you're, if you're charging too little, but the sales process is too hard, and takes too much of my time, then I as a salesperson can't actually hit my quota or it's too exhausting for me to hit my quota. And I'd rather work in a different company with a product that's priced differently where I can hit my quota more easily, right? Um, and this relates to you know, what, you know, what's the economic logic for a salesperson to work for you? How good are they, right? And, and you know, what's the right compensation plan? And can I hit my on-target earnings or not, right? So all of these things have to work together and the best, most successful companies make sure that all of these four kind of unit economic models are working smoothly and seamlessly. Um, as a founder and a CEO, even as a very early stage company, um, it's very important to accept your role as salesperson in chief, right? Um, CEOs and founders are always selling. You're selling your product, you're selling positions at your company, you're selling equity in your company to investors like me. Um, and ultimately your ability to sell effectively is translates directly into your ability to survive as a company. Um, and a lot of founders are sort of uncomfortable with this or don't like it. Um, I think it's very, very important to embrace that reality. Um, if you can't sell the product yourself, by the way, how can you hire someone to do that? Um, and I think the, the best advice I can give you is to think of this as a massive learning opportunity for the company and for you personally. Um, if selling is not something that comes naturally to you and sales is not something that comes naturally to you, this is an opportunity to grow personally and, and add that to your arsenal of tools and embrace that challenge. Um, the other thing is that you should discover the buying and selling process. Um, people spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, what's the right product and what's the right technology and, and what's the right message. But there's also a buying and a selling process, right? How do your customers buy your product? What are the segments? What are the blockers? Who are the, who are the catalysts and the gateways and the personas in your target organization, right? Maybe you're selling something that really helps 
um, you know, developers, for example, but it makes ops people really upset or makes ops people feel like they're extraneous or, it, or it's making someone feel like their job is under threat, right? Make sure you've identified all of those, all of those things. Make sure you've under, understood who, are, who is your natural ally and who's your natural blocker and what can you do to impact that process. Um, lesson 12, um, when we think about revenue and you know, ultimately the job of sales is to drive revenue, so these things relate very tightly, um, I think there's basically four different measures of revenue quality. And as an early stage startup that's going off to raise the next round, a lot of the traction and sales that you're doing today are designed to build traction so that you can get your next round. So let's think about what, you know, what revenue means. Um, the first V of revenue quality is the volume, right? How many customers are you selling to? Right? One customer is obviously not so good. Hundreds of customers is better, right? So the more customers you have in theory, that makes things look better. Pretty obvious, right? Um, value is another one though. How much could they pay, right? So this is kind of the opposite of volume in the sense, if you have one customer who's paying you $100,000, maybe that's better than a thousand customers who are paying you $1, right? Because you haven't proven the value. You've proven that you can get many people interested, but you haven't proven you can extract any value. Whereas maybe in another scenario, I've got one customer and he really values what I'm doing. He's willing to pay me. He'll go on record. He's investing a lot of time and energy in my solution. That may be a more important indication of value than a number of customers, right? Um, velocity is also pretty important. How fast are people coming on? What's the sales cycle really like? It's a measure of how compelling your product is and how efficient it is to onboard and all of that stuff. So even if your numbers are very small, the velocity that you have and the, the, the pace at which you're adding accounts can be a significant signal of value to VCs looking at your business, um, particularly if the value is high. So if you had a, like a $100,000 account, but he closed in three months, that's pretty good, right? Um, that's relatively high velocity given the amount of value you're able to generate. Um, and validation is the other one, right? So the logo, who is the customer, right? Do they matter? Do they know what they're doing? Have they evaluated your competition? Are they willing to go to bat for you and tell investors that what you're doing is awesome? Um, that's pretty important. Um, and there, it doesn't necessarily matter if they're paying. As long as they're willing to say that it's awesome, that they would pay or that you're the best solution on the market, that has a lot of value. Um, not all revenue is created equal. Um, and what I mean by this is that a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars of revenue has different value depending on how it's coming in, right? So, and, and a lot of this relates to how are there in indications in the contract of how important and repeatable and scalable the, the thing that you're selling is. Um, you know, the first and, and least valuable level would be professional services, right? That's not even really repeatable software. It usually is very low margin. It's not that exciting. Traditional license revenue is, is better because it's a product. Recurring license revenue is even better because the expectation is they'll come back the next year um, or, the next, in, or, or the next month, like the SaaS you know, model. Um, recurring license that's committed is better, right? For 12 months, that's a, that's a better commitment. A much longer commitment, if they've committed to pay you for 36 months, it's even better, even if you've had to give them a discount to get them to do that. And then recurring license for a longer commitment with the cash up front is even better. And the reason for that is obvious. You have the cash coming in and you can use that cash to grow even faster. And this is sort of the, the nirvana state for a SaaS business or frankly, any, any software business. If you can get people to pay you cash up front for a committing recurring license that's expected to roll over anyway, but you can draw that cash up front. As a venture business, you don't need to go to VCs and get them to take 20% of your business for $20 million because your customers can fund your own growth, right? I mean, think about it. If you have a $100,000 piece of software and you sell th a, a three-year license, you know, that's, that's $300,000. If you do it at a 20% discount, you can take, you know, over $200,000 home, you know, $240,000 home cash up front right now and you can use that to pay the base salary for another sales guy to go off and do it again. So you might be able to scale up your business without even having to raise money, which is an amazing thing to pull off. Now, I've actually seen this happen in companies I've invested in and when it happens, it's amazing and the valuation just skyrockets because people have figured this out. Um, we've hinted at this before, but repeatability is much better than revenue. Um, smart investors will back a great founder with a clear vision but the opportunity to build a repeatable business is more important than the current revenue because repeat, repeatability is a predictor of growth, right? If people get a sense that this is repeatable, that means they're, you're going to be able to scale the business. So from a VC perspective, two customers that look exactly the same, 
is a lot better than 10, 10 customers where each of them is different. Because if you did it twice, you can probably do it a hundred times. If you, if, 10, if you did it 10 times and each one is different, then the 11th one is going to be as difficult as the 10th one. And we're not actually getting any better. And we're not actually de-risking the things that really matter, which is not, can I get to a million dollars in sales? It's, can I get to $10 million in sales? That's the real question. And so to get from you know, zero to one is awesome. To get from one to 10 is much harder. It's a different story. You want to believe that getting from one to 10 is going to be easier than getting from zero to one, right? That's, that's the key. So repeatability, better than revenue. Uh, lesson 15, uh, sales-driven product. Um, I think it's very, very important to build a sales-driven product culture um, and make sure that the VP sales or whoever's responsible for sales, in many cases, that's one of the founders, is talking to whoever's responsible for product, right? Um, the picture of the Coke cans is basically trying to make the point that, you know, Coke is wonderful. It's a delicious drink, right? But the real genius is that it's easy to consume that product. You can get it in a can, you can get it in a bottle, you can get it in a vending machine, you can get it in McDonald's. Like they've, they've made sure to make sure that their product is really easy to deliver, right? Those Coke cans are designed so they stack nicely in a truck. You can easily move them around. It's ready to drink. It's right. It, it's the product is not just the, 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 you know, the liquid, it's the, it's the whole package, right? And, and the, the point I'm making here is that your sales process is a wonderful source of feedback on what can we do in the product to make it easier, to make it easier to sell, right? At the end of the day, the whole point of the product team is to make the salesperson's life easy. Sometimes that's new features and sometimes that's other things. Sometimes it's, hey, I need, you know, rapid onboarding. I need quick integration with something. I need it to run on-prem. I need it to run in the cloud. I need it to, to you know, do, I need it to, I need to be able to click a button and translate it into Japanese. Whatever it is, um, th your salespeople will know what those things are that would make their life easier. Um, and finally, um, I really believe that if you're a seed company, you're sort of gearing up for your Series A, and your Series A story is primarily about sales. And to, just to illustrate this point, I've taken the Sequoia Capital um, pitch template, which is 10 sections. Um, these are the sections that Sequoia recommends that you have 10 slides in your Series A deck, right? Um, and the point I'm trying to make, and I'm not going to go into every one of these, but that every one of these points can be looked at through the lens of sales, right? So for example, team, how are you going to scale revenue? Now that you've proven revenue, right? How can you scale that sales operation? Business model, we talked a lot about the unit economics and all that stuff. Product, it's not just my product is awesome, but it should be my product is easy to sell, right? Um, competition, the same thing. Why is my product better than competitors in a way that is going to be easy for my salespeople to communicate? If the competitive differentiation of your product is buried somewhere deep in the code, salespeople may not be able to talk about it and customers may not care, right? So all of these kind of series A elements ultimately relate back to, can you drive efficient sales and sales growth? Um, that is the presentation. I hope that's been somewhat helpful. Um, uh, let me stop sharing and then uh, Trevor, I don't know if, if you're still here, but hopefully you are. Yeah, thank you very much, Gil. Um, we went a couple minutes over there, but um, so uh, unfortunately we don't have time for any questions, but we thank you very much uh, for being here. And hopefully next year you can join us uh, in Cluj. Cool, I, I, I would love it, thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much again for your time, Gil. Thanks a lot.